So we are now going to move to the last uh, speaker of uh, the session, and I would like to welcome on stage um, one of the uh, most prestigious uh, colleagues in RILM dealing with cultural heritage, Professor Paolo Lorenzo for the University of Minho, Portugal. Okay, so thank you very much. First, for the organizers for inviting me here. I think I was thinking this morning, uh, and uh, I think in the last uh, half a dozen years, with the exception of Brussels, which is the sort of center of funding in Europe, Chennai is the world city I've been more. Uh, I think this is the, my fifth time, so it's always a pleasure to be here. And I thank IIT Madras for well making me feel at home. Uh, the second issue, well, mostly people think about masonry when we talk about heritage buildings. And I thought, because I had the impression there were several practitioners in the room, to show a little bit of engineering in the end of my presentation. So I will show you some of the applications we make of research. And I, I will show a reinforced concrete building just to see that, uh, well, in fact, uh, all buildings are very similar if you're talking about cultural heritage and how to address the problems. Um, well, I will start with a, a very simple statement on the relevance of the work uh, we do. And uh, the, um, the most important issue, as you see here, is addressing cultural heritage has to do with our identity. So what makes us as Indians or Europeans or whatever part of the world you belong to. And there are many famous statements on why identity is important. If you don't have identity, you don't have a country, you don't have a nation. And uh, the second issue which makes cultural heritage so important, as you can see there, tourists, uh, tourism uh, in Europe is about 10% 10 10 of the wealth. And 50% of the world tourists go to Europe. So it's a major source of revenue in Europe, and monuments are very important for tourism. Now, also when you look at construction, and I think this is quite interesting for developing countries, you can see that about 40% of the market in construction in Europe um, is for renovation and maintenance. And this is a major difference with developing countries. I've been, uh, while well, traveling through different countries in the world where conservation is hardly an issue, and we saw this also in, in the first presentation. But in Europe, half of my students, at least, will work in conservation. And so we have no troubles in finding top students and in stressing the relevance of conserving the world heritage. And the point that has been made before is that, well, once you build, you have a large investment and then you have a large investment to maintain the buildings or the built heritage. And this is valid for the infrastructure, this is valid for all the buildings. So buildings cost a lot of money. And uh, in Europe, what we are facing is that in many cases, we don't have enough money to keep it. We see the same in North America. Well, the aging infrastructure is very clear. In Europe, we have many cities, many rural dwellings where just just being abandoned because there's no way we can keep them. So this is also, of course, a lesson to other parts of the world where we're building so much, if we can do better than what we've done in the past. Now, if you have a building and you don't maintain it, it will just eventually die and you will lose it. And water is a major issue. Of course, extreme events like hurricanes or earthquakes are also major issues. There was a very nice presentation yesterday on earthquakes, so I will not almost address earthquakes today. But this is a recurrent problem, and it's a very important problem, of course, for India, where we have recurrently very large magnitude earthquakes. And just very briefly, I will show you a couple of slides on earthquakes. Existing buildings, most of the times, they have not been designed for earthquakes. They have been designed for gravity loading. This is a wall of masonry with two retaining walls being tested out of plane. It's a very weak material. Often these materials are heavy, they are poorly connected, and the consequence are huge losses in terms of property and in terms of lives. 
Now it's relatively simple to make it better just by ensuring connections. This is a typical building built in the 18th, early 19th century in Lisbon. If you connect, that's what we did, just connecting the timber floors with the walls, we increase the capacity to the double and the performance of the building is much better. Of course, we will not like to see pieces falling, that's against the code and it will kill people, but still the performance increased more or less to the double, which is impressive for an intervention which has no cost, because the connection, it basically, it's almost for free. Huh? Now, if you do nothing, which is what we are mostly doing around the world, uh, then the losses are very important. This is a survey we made in 120 churches in New Zealand. And you can see that, well, about two-thirds of the, of the churches were lost. And this is a more or less normal figure throughout the world when you have a strong shake. Well, most of the built heritage will be lost if it has not been designed for earthquakes. Now, let's look what we try to do when we have this piece of built heritage that we want to keep. We assume it's part of our heritage, it's part of our identity. We want to bring it to the next generation. Now, I show you a very simple picture, which is two walls, two thin walls with a vault. Of course, if you have a vault, a curved structure, this will introduce thrust in the walls. If the walls are not stiff enough, they will open up and cracks will appear. Okay? Now, there's many things you can do. You can add buttresses. These are a bit ugly, but it has been used a lot in the past. The foundations are usually a nightmare in many historic or heritage buildings because there were no concerns about foundations. The construction process was very slow, so you could accommodate a lot of deformation. And the foundations are normally very bad, so maybe you need to enlarge them. Maybe you also need to take it to deeper strata or even to make it better for earthquake by introducing some piling or some micropiling. Or maybe you want to enlarge the structure to make it more robust. Now, if you do something like this, this, was, this is what we don't want to do. It's just too expensive, it's impossible to pay. It's a destruction of the cultural value, because what we have now is something totally different from what we had in the past. And this is against the modern view in how to act in heritage buildings. So the modern view is to try to do as little as possible, as it was stated before. Maybe the building is fine, and many buildings, many monuments I worked with, they were fine. We did nothing. Maybe you need to monitor. Maybe you need to install a very simple system, like some light ties that you can even remove. And maybe you want to monitor these ties and see the performance. So the modern trend is to do as little as possible. This is, makes sense from the economic point of view. It makes sense from the point of view of preserving the cultural value, okay? So we move, we change from this idea of the past of making massive interventions, forget what you have in a building, and to do as little as possible to preserve the structure, okay? And the simple analogy that we use on conservation is just to think about medicine, because fortunately or unfortunately, all of us go to the doctor. And we just say that a, a conservation engineer is like a doctor. So when you go to the doctor, we will try to reconstitute your history, your family history. And this is what we try to do with a building. The doctor will ask you which diseases you had, well, what your family had as diseases, and we try to do the same with the building. Then the doctor will ask you for complementary exams in order to make a diagnosis. This is exactly what we do. We have techniques today, today we've seen them in, in the presentations of the morning, that allow us to do very high-tech understanding of the condition of a building. Then we have a diagnosis and we define an intervention measure or some remedial measures. And I think all of you, if a doctor tells you to make a very complicated operation, you'll think it twice and you'll ask for a second opinion, okay? My daughter, for example, she had to do, one doctor recommended a knee surgery, okay? And we didn't like it. 
when she was young. So he asked a second doctor and he said, she needs nothing. And this was 10 years ago and she needed nothing. Okay? So if someone recommends a very heavy, dangerous intervention in the building, you should ask for a second opinion. Okay? And the last, I think, very interesting point also is don't forget that the doctors want you back. So maybe they want you back in six months, in one year, in two years. And you have to do the same to the building. Be sure what you did, well, worked. Or maybe something else is needed. Okay? And this analogy, I think, is very clear on what we try to do. So if you have bad engineering, bad understanding of traditional materials and techniques, and concrete is also traditional material and technique, We've saw, we saw it in the conference, concrete is also very old, huh? so there's many concretes that modern engineers have no idea. They have no idea, also on the steel inside, okay? So if you don't know the history, you will end up, in most cases, with a disaster. And this is again an example of we, what we don't want to do. This is an intervention I was not involved, which is totally unacceptable from the point of view of choice of materials, from the point of view of loss of cultural value, from the point of view of durability, from the point of view of compatibility, from the point of view of performance. Everything is wrong. And it was done and it was accepted. Okay. So what we try to do, in a simple way, is to combine things that exist, things that we, we see, which we can address as empirical, with some modeling. Okay? So we combine the history, we combine the condition assessment, we combine monitoring, and then we'll end up with some model that will try to make predictions of the behavior. This model needs to be validated. If you fail to validate, the outcome will be a disaster. So we combine evidence with hypothesis, and this combination will define our intervention, our conclusions on the building. There are many issues which are complex in the process. I normally say that conservation is the most exciting field in structural engineering. Because you are going in a difficult field where you have very little support. For example, most codes are not applicable. For many engineers, this is a disaster because, well, you have liability issues, because you don't have a safety net. I personally like it because it allows me to do many things that sometimes code make it more difficult to make. Okay? Also, you have to understand that the outcome is subjective. And the outcome has a lot of uncertainty because there's many things you don't know. When you design a new building, it's relatively easy, we saw it today with difficulties, to make specifications. When you have an existing building, this is what you have. A lot of times you don't know well the history, we don't know well the components, we don't know well the materials, we don't know well the building process, we don't know well the damage. So there's many things you don't know and you have to accept you don't know. You make best guesses, the best possible studies, but uncertainty will be there, subjectivity will be there. This means we require qualified engineers, qualified workers to do the job. Now, I'm a structural engineer, and when we talk about safety, it's also quite interesting that people working in conservation tend to adopt a different approach towards safety, which is a Again, subjective approach. This again stresses the quality of a second opinion when needed. So we try to combine an historic approach, a qualitative approach with an analytic approach and an experimental approach. And this is the sum of these approaches that will lead to a verdict. So you have a building standing. A building is a testimony, something you can read, you can understand. This has a lot of value. If your model tells you the building should have collapsed and the building is standing, is your model which is incorrect, not the building. The second issue is this inductive procedure. Architects love inductive reasoning. Engineers tend to hate it and tend to be too analytic, huh? too, well, I think constrained by the deductive process. So you have to learn by comparison, you have to learn by experience, okay? You have to learn by making analogies. 
This is again a more subjective process. Of course, we should not forget the deductive procedure, which is the roots, I would say, of structural engineering, and is something very, very important, but it is one component of our judgment. And we should not also forget that we can test buildings. So we can monitor, we can maybe do load tests, so there's many information we can learn from testing the building. And it's the sum of this that should lead us to a conclusion, okay? Now, I will show you very, very briefly a couple of images on re recent research. Now, our group is relatively large. We have maybe 25 PhD students working in this field at the moment. And so we're doing many things in different fields. Huh? And I think the research in masonry, and particularly in, in historic masonry, grew enormously in the last years. And we know as much as we know for concrete, or for steel, or for timber. And so it is a modern, I think, field of research, and we're doing advanced testing of these traditional materials, be it earth, or brick, or stone, or mortar. We are doing advanced testing on many diagnosis techniques, many structural health monitoring techniques, okay? We are doing, I think, amazing things in terms of computer simulation. So as we've seen here today, I think the capabilities that we have today on simulation are unthinkable of all of, okay? We can model a full building today with a reasonably well-trained student in a couple of months, maybe one month, which is unthinkable because the graphic capabilities are so strong, because our material models are so strong. You know? It doesn't mean the outcome is perfect because you need data. Uh, and sometimes data is more difficult to get. And again, there is uncertainty. But we have available models that can predict almost anything today. And of course, there's many tests, as we saw yesterday also with uh, Professor Valuzzi's presentation on remedial measures. So there's many, many new developments on new materials, new techniques that we can use and apply. So we try to somehow in our research activity to address these different issues with, uh, well, different students working different levels. I show you just a glimpse of some of these recent PhD students. For example, multi-physics of cement and concrete is very well known and many people have been working there for years. Strangely, very few people have been working on lime. Hmm? And we, have been, we have been doing things characterizing the carbonation field, the humidity field, the temperature field, the mechanic field, and then putting it all together. And you can see, for example, we are able to replicate extremely well already the development of young lime and the progress of the different fields in time. For example, something that um, it's, of course, very exciting that we saw also here today has to do with structural health monitoring. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. All of us have a, 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 a slurometer 3D in our cell phone. That's why the cell phone knows if you're putting it up or sideways or if you're making a step. Of course, this cheap 20 or 30 cents a slurometer, it's not very sensitive. It catches very strong motion. But we can already do amazing things with these very cheap sensors. For example, what you see there, it's a super cheap sensor that we were able to synchronize and we were able to do identification of the vibration characteristics of a building and the frequency picking with a sensor which costs nothing that you can put many of them in your structure, okay? The issue is no longer the sensor. The issue today is the energy for the sensor and the energy for communication, okay? Because you generate a lot of data and this is a big problem to transfer. For example, other things which are, I think, a large community is working on now is on durability issues. And you saw it was also stated yesterday, this first generation of FRP materials, fiber reinforced polymers, they are basically prohibited in Europe um, for application in historic buildings. There's many reasons for that. Compatibility, durability, well, difficulties, water vapor pressure, difficult for water 
release. There's many salts in the buildings. They are now being used in many countries, in the, well, many developing countries, but in Europe, nobody is using any more, almost nobody is using any more glued systems. Huh? We, s we replace them by, by, by systems based placed with mortars or inorganic matrices, okay? But we have been active, and there's many activity done in Rylam on durability of these systems. And so here you can see different cycles on durability, and uh, the most modern techniques being applied to assess the durability and trying to define uh, provision models. We are now starting a campaign that we thought for 20 years. So we're putting a campaign on uh, trying to correlate accelerated aging with actual, um, let's say, actual time, because compressing the time is probably one of the, our most difficult research issues. And another simple e example of recent research, we have been much, uh, well, working significantly on BLAST, and these are some examples on BLAST testing of masonry materials and masonry components. And risk analysis, for example, we have been carrying out the risk analysis for all transportation network in Portugal. And to see, well, which measures you need to do in order to have acceptable risk, okay? Well, as I promised you, I decided to, to present some engineering uh, applications. And I think we are lucky enough to have been involved in many important and several UNESCO World Heritage case in Portugal and out of Portugal, and combining the research with engineering experience. I think this is a very important issue when we are able to make it, and I think it, it's excellent for engineering uh, faculties to combine the two worlds. Otherwise, I think research is very difficult to apply, and it's sometimes it's even difficult to guide our research. Now, some of these techniques are state-of-the-art, and of course they are expensive and difficult to use. But I believe the methodology, the approach of conservation engineering is well established and should be used in any case. It doesn't matter. It can be used for the most important monument in India. It can be used for the simple applications. Okay? I'll show two simple applications I think I have about seven minutes or five minutes. Okay? One is a masonry building. The other one is a masonry concrete building, okay? And I will show you what we did, okay? Both of, both of these applications are a little bit crazy, yeah? So we have done much simpler things, but I think these two applications are less common. And uh, I think the solutions are very interesting and challenge our mind, okay? Now, this is a cloister which has been partly ruined. It is propped, it's in a pre-collapsed condition. You can see the first floor has crossed vaults, the second floor has barrel vaults. The damage is impressive, okay? You have many cracks, you have temporary propping. To show you how impressive you have the damage, you have a span of a vault of three meters and you have 15 centimeters deformation. This is how impressive it is, okay? Or you have, for example, well, this crack is not too large, it's five centimeters. These cracks on the side, they are about five centimeters. Huh? So the vaults are totally separated from the walls. For example, here, you can see the mapping of the formations of this wall. This wall is 60 centimeters thickness, and it's out of plane deformation is 20 centimeters. So this is what we're talking about. Huge deformations, huge cracks, huge damage. Well, fortunately, it was propped. Otherwise, I think it would have probably collapsed. No? It was propped for a decade or so. Now, the decision of the team, mostly of the architecture, the cultural heritage authorities, was to keep the monument as a ruin. Okay? And this is an important decision if you're doing an intervention. You have to, to know what is the objective? Huh? And the decision here was to kept it as a ruin. Modern recommendations say, normally, what you do should be visible. Most of the interventions we do today, they are visible in the building. They are part of the history. They are not something to hide. In this case, because of the decision, it was very important to hide everything. 
because we wanted to keep it looking as a ru ruin. It's not hidden in the sense there's many photos, there's all the drawings, all the design specifications, so this is documented. But for the visitor, it remains, or the objective was to remain invisible. Again, we tried to do as little as possible. And we only acted where we needed. For example, these two uh, wings were in very bad condition, so we acted in these two wings. The other wings were more or less fine. We kept them. Okay? There was a little bit of movement, so we lift the vaults, these two vaults. We lift them about 10 centimeters. We move the corner, this corner that you see with the tie. We move them also about 10 centimeters because the cracks were enormous, so we had to pull it back. And this monastery had a huge problem with foundations. Strangely, we decided not to act on the foundations because we believe it's not needed. Okay? And we told the client that if there was an issue in foundations, well, this will be known in the future and then it could be possible to act. The issue is behind this, uh, under this monument, there is another monument, older, 500 years older, which was not well documented, and whatever you do, we destroy it totally. It was not needed, in my belief, and we simulate and the practice say it was not needed. So what we did, did we do? We put the ties, normally if you have an arch, it poses a thrust and you need a tie. We put the ties not in the below where you have the springing or you have the thrust, but we put it up. Now if you put the ties up, of course the system is not in equilibrium. And in this case, a crack would show up in the bottom of the, of the, of the wall. And so we needed to tie the wall down in order to have sufficient capacity to resist this bending action, okay? And now, of course, there, is, there are always some tricks, but on this side, for example, we have on the, on the right side, there is no anchoring plate because the masonry is irregular. On the left side, you have very big blocks of masonry. The bond is not so good, and we added an anchor plate, as you can see there, okay? On the lower floor, we have enough weight to counterbalance the fact that the thrust and the tie are not aligned, so you need nothing. The weight is enough in order to ensure no cracking, so we did nothing. And you have an adjustable tie, all these ties are adjustable, and we kept it like this on the upper part. And again, we acted only when needed, not everywhere in the structure. These are some examples of the execution. So we open up the structure a little bit in the left, as you can see because we wanted to lift the vault. If you want to lift the vault, if you want to move a wall, you have to have the capacity of the structure to move. And because the vaults on the sides were full of earth and things that felt, you need to clean them before. If you want to move a wall, you have to open the cracks. If someone closed the cracks, you cannot open the wall. You induce damage. So we, opened, we made these openings that you see in the left. We removed the, the, the dirt the rubber, and then we lift the wall. And when you lift, uh, lift the vault, when you lift the vault, you have a major crack from bottom to top. We fill it with grout, it is visible, it's part of the history of the building. And these are some details of uh, the execution. This is all stainless steel, the most expensive you can find. It's absolutely no problem because the quantities we use, it's so limited that it has no influence in the cost. It will cost you three times a cheap stainless steel, but it's fine, okay? The same for the grouting materials. These are lime-based grouting materials. They are very well known. They are available in the market. You can produce them themselves. Then everything was, well, the forces were controlled by torque. And this is the final view of just after finishing the works. And I think it was very nice because the well, the Prime Minister visit once we finished the works and he asked us, what have you been do doing here? So this was exactly what the team wanted. We could not see any works done. Finally, I think I have one or two minutes. I'll go very fast. My reinforced concrete building. This is a mix. It's an early reinforced concrete building. 1930s is one of the first in this city. It's a very interesting building. It has main beams con connecting the granite masonry walls. It has secondary beams. And then it has some walls, which was, this was a, a, a religious school for priests. And then each cell had this very thin reinforced concrete wall, okay? It's 
It's a very interesting building. And we made a model of this. I mean, you do, we did what you normally do in a reinforced concrete building. You do the tests on the concrete, the tests on the steel. You open up the structure to see. Use maybe radar, elect other electron rate bar detectors. And you find what you have. We found what is normal in, in this type of buildings, at least in Portugal, where I work most in concrete. The, the strength concrete is reasonably good because there's a lot of hardening during process, also in the cement used. The quantity of reinforcement is extremely low. Sometimes it's below the minimum quantity of reinforcement because there was very little knowledge. And we made a safety assessment. It would not be safe. They decided to use in one of the wings one side for uh, an archive. So the, the weight was enormous. It was one ton per square meter or something like this. Just to show you what we did and I will finalize. Well, you had this proposal from the architect on the left on putting the closets for the archive. And our strengthening measure was very simple. Just move the, the closets from the center to the sides and you'd need absolutely no strengthening. The capacity was enough. It's much better for the room and there was no strengthening made. Okay? The second issue is the global safety of the building. So we did the typical models. We found the capacity, the strength of the model is very low. So you have this upper part which is very stiff, the lower part which has nothing in, be in below. It's a big hole. And so we decided to strengthen this hole. There's basically two possibilities. The easiest one, which is go to the lower beam or to the lower floor and put, for example, a new steel grid in order to support the entire building. Okay? It was expensive a lot of architectural implications. So again, we had a different approach, and the approach was suspend the building, lift it all up, introduce a new steel truss in between the existing timber trusses, and do nothing in the bottom. So we moved the load from all this cage of reinforced concrete to the new steel system. We bring it back to the external walls. The external walls had enough capacity. They are very good quality, thick granite walls. We check it for the earthquake. It's a very low hazard zone. There is absolutely no problem. There is also no history of a building being damaged by or collapsed by an earthquake in the last thousand years or so. And so this is what we did. And it is also there, no damage. OK? So I think I tried to show you how important conservation is in developing countries. We saw many presentations today on the importance of conservation. And I tried to show you how exciting it is to work in a field where you always have to look for new solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo, for the, this uh, very interesting presentation. I think it, uh, it was a nice conclusion for this uh, thematic session uh, about uh, conservation, durability, and uh, uh, prediction of life. Uh, unfortunately, we're running a bit out of time. If you have any question to Paolo, I suggest that you, you go and talk to him uh, during the, one of the following breaks. Uh, I'm going to use this mic. It's Andy. Uh, so I would like, I would like to conclude this session by, uh, by a new uh, specific uh, event. So we started this session with uh, the awarding of a most prestigious technical award, the Robert Lamit Medal, but in the previous recent years, Rylem has uh, created a few new awards because we wanted to uh, recognize the potential of uh, the youngest members that we had uh, in our association. And today, I guess, we're moving one step forward again uh, with the awarding of, uh, of uh, an award that would be awarded every year during the Wallem Week, and this award is the Best Student Poster Award. So this year, the, the jury, this year and for the first time, so the first jury of the history of this new award uh, was uh, made of Professor Yunus Bellim from South Africa, Professor Pranoy, uh, Suvanani Pranoy from USA, and Professor Pijush Ghosh from India. So the criteria for this poster, uh, this poster should be awarded to a currently registered student in, uh, in the Rylem Week. And then uh, it is mostly based on the evaluation of the technical content of the poster, of the project. Of course, clarity of poster presentation and uh, logical flow of argument is a main criterion at this level of uh, research. And uh, it is 
deeply appreciated if the student is present during the poster session to answer all questions, which is, seems to make sense. Um, so I would like to welcome on stage uh, the winner of uh, this uh, Rylem Best Student Poster Prize. And uh, this student is uh, Shripiya Rengaraju. So, yes. Congratulations. So I'm going, I'm going to say why were the jury selected you, because they have some information about this. So the, judge was, the judges were impressed by the innovative approach uh, that was uh, brought to the problem definition and the solution. Uh, the, judges were, the judges were also impressed uh, by the focus on uh, fundamental material science to address a practical engineering problem. And um, they told me that uh, you made a very clear presentation of a very complex topic. And considering the name of your work, challenges in determining the chloride threshold of steel embedded in cement schistous system, and considering what we've heard today about this kind of problem, I guess we all agree that it's very complex and it's very needed work. So, congratulations. I'm going to give you this. So I would like now to close this session. I thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it was a very nice idea to group all these lecturers together. By chance, even the award uh, of the poster was linked to the same uh, topic. And uh, as uh, this session was after the very nice uh, gala dinner evening we had last night, and I know that some of us uh, make it made it a bit longer at the hotel bar. Uh, I think the attendance this morning was great uh, considering all these uh, circumstances. So I'm really happy to have you uh, add, add you all uh, to this morning here. And uh, with this, I would like to close this Rylam technical session and uh, wish you a nice day and a nice lunch. <laughs>